I want to remind this very smart room that the number one advertiser on Google during the five to seven golden years of it being massively underpriced attention was a company called Amazon. When you strike, when you have the best hand, you win. You got your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I don't get that. You know, in 1996, my dad had a liquor store in New Jersey. That's as traditional as you get. Yeah. That was 22 years ago. Um, and and I put my dad's store on online, and I did email marketing, and I did Google, and I did content, and then a couple months after YouTube came out, I started a YouTube show in 2006, which is now 12 years ago. I, I, I have no respect, or and normally I deploy a lot of empathy. I, I struggle deploying empathy. I struggle deploying compassion. If you were a business operator in 2018, Heading, you know, by the time we're recording this in October, 2019, yeah. which is when the majority of people are gonna listen to this, and, you, and your excuse is, well, I'm a pub, or I make tomato juice, or I have three restaurants. Like, I, digital is oxygen. It's, 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 the real world feels secondary. Yeah. Like, to not be a communicator, content producer, um, part of the conversation, like, it's, it's now, it, it's gone from cute and naive to grossly negligent. Yeah. And I just think it's unacceptable to be a business in 2019 in the same way that it would be to pay people not minimum wage. Like I, I literally believe it's grossly unacceptable. Like to me it's like, it's like to, to quantify digital versus traditional, it's just marketing. Like yeah. really, you think sending direct mail print is a better thing to do than advertising on Instagram as a restaurant? Like, like really, like really sit down with me. You're telling me right now that it's a better deal to spend all that money making a flyer and sending it direct mail yeah. or running a radio ad or buying a small little ad in a newspaper. Like this is what you're telling me. It is 2019. Yeah. I felt bad in 2002. It was early. Yeah. The internet was new. I had compassion. It was cute. In 2007 it was like, mm, it was kind of like, like, hey, annoying, kind of like, mm, but still kind of, in 2012, it's like, you're not smart. In 2019, like, yeah. you, you deserve to die. Look, I want people to be healthy and happy. I just don't think that we should demonize people that love their work. Yeah. And we've gone the other way. Like, like I love working. Like, like, it, like I'm sad when I'm not working. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't I work? Like, who's to tell me what time I should spend with my like work-life balance? Like, I will never have the audacity to tell somebody how to parent. Mm -hmm. I will have my points of view. I will share them just like others. But nobody under nobody talks about quality. Yeah. Everybody's talking about quantity. Like that's very nice that mom and dad are home at 5 p.m. but if they're both still working on the phone, mm -hmm. are they actually spending time with the kids? Like so, you know, people need to be healthy. And so like, if you're working yourself into depression, I think people don't understand that most people have bad work-life balance because they buy dumb shit because they wanna look cool in front of other people because they're insecure. We, this is not a work-life balance conversation. This is a keeping up with the Joneses conversation. Yeah. Maybe if you didn't buy that home that has six extra rooms that you never use, maybe you wouldn't have to stress at work because maybe, you know, this is a far more complex conversation than I talk about hustle. I talk about hustle, here's why. If I looked at all of us right now and everybody behind these cameras or reading this article and said, get smarter, more talented, I want you to get more talented. That's very tricky. That's unbelievably ideological advice. If I said, look, two extra hours of work actually has an impact on your success if that's what you're trying to achieve, that's practical. Yeah. You don't have to, but it's controllable. Yeah. Work ethic is controllable. Being born with talent is not. So a lot of my friends in Silicon Valley who made 50 million bucks because they had ridiculous DNA and unbelievable 
platforms of entitlement and advantages and all these other things that after they make their 50 million bucks, they look down on everybody and say, have better work-life balance. That's very sweet, Mm -hmm. but that's audacious. On the flip side, the 95% of people who are not happy with what's going on, if they, you know, if they work on their side hustle after they work and after four years they're selling more strawberry jam on the internet than the money they're making being an account executive at Gray or at Vayner yeah. and now they're happy, that makes me happy. Yeah. So I think it's a much more complex conversation yeah. than hey people, meditate for an hour a day and you'll be happy. That is band-aids. Yeah. Why do you need to meditate? What are you up to? and what are you doing with your life, and why are you working? First line, what's up? I'm here in London, I got a Facebook Messenger uh, hoodie that's pretty fucking rad, and so I'm Facebook messaging you, and I'm gonna sign it right now, and then Andy and DRock are about to hide it, you're about to watch them hide it, and then one of you are gonna find it. We're having fun on First in Line London. We're having fun. A little signature. Andy, DRock, hide it. Products and things there that allow us to shoot completely different things. I think we have a very weak creative conversation around the new channels. I am fascinated that people even have this debate. How many people here have bought something on Wish, the shopping app? Raise your hands. Raise it high. Own it, don't be scared. Cool, how many people here have never heard? It's cool, I need the honesty here and everyone's very fucking like this. How many people here have never heard of Wish, the shopping app? Raise your hands. This is the best moment of my life. One more time. You have not heard of Wish, the shopping app? Raise your hands, hi. Okay, this is the best, thank you very much. Wish, depending on who you listen to because it's a private kind of thing, company, is doing anywhere between three to six billion dollars in revenue. Which is probably the closest thing to any kind of conceivable threat to Amazon in the world. Wish is doing three to six billion dollars in sales. They're spending 98% of their money outside of a Lakers, Los Angeles Lakers patch on the jersey and the McGregor Mayweather fight, they bought the corner. Outside of those two activations, they were spending 98% of their money on Facebook ads. Wish's founders are engineers from Google that worked on the Google AdWords product. Wish is doing three to six billion dollars in sales and more than half of this room, this room, not some fucking random hundred people on the street in London, this room, more than half of the people don't even know what it is. That is the punchline. Thank you. (laughs) I think why it's the punchline for me is I have empathy to why that is. You know, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they make decisions in a focus group of one. I have never made a business decision in my life based on my own behavior. That is laughable, stupid, and just naive at best and ideologically kind of like, (laughs) just it's not a good idea. And so I'm fascinated by how many people go into rooms and say, Gary, you're right, my 14-year-old daughter uses Instagram. Great, John. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> this is not about you or your three friends or your 17-year-old niece or like what your grandma did yesterday. This is fucking data at scale. This is black and white happened. This is not happening, this isn't coming. 90 plus percent of the Fortune 500 CPG brands are declining in market share. In their marketing behavior, 80% of their spend is either on television or programmatic digital, which is digital 2006. This is not confusing. Meanwhile, Gymshark and Fashion Nova and Lola and Movement Watches are going from zero to 25, 50, 100, 500, million dollars in sales on 100% spend on influencer, Facebook, and Instagram. This is not subjective debate, like if a video is funny. This is what's happening in the business world. Now, (laughs) just as an observation, because it's funny to say, Facebook has done an unbelievably poor job 
in showcasing the people that use the platform properly in chasing the BMWs and McDonald's and Porsches and GEs of the world. Companies that blindly work on things that have nothing to do, back to the prior presentation, with actual business, but this entire industry that I've come to love trades on either subjective ego opinions or complete horse shit metrics. <laughs> Included in horse shit metrics are things like data logic. The way that I sold Facebook finally to corporate America because they finally found a report that they liked, even though the ROAS on every report of data logics is so phenomenal, yet the business did not grow. Data Logics is Facebook's version of Nielsen's and Millard Brown and internal MMMs that don't take inputs from Facebook and all the other currency that people are trading on that has nothing to do with the actual business. I'm fascinated by this because it is not very difficult to do an A-B test that does a holdout cluster that can prove to Nestle's if their ads on Facebook versus their ads on television are driving sales at Tesco or Sainsbury or Walmart. You can do it if you actually cared to do it. This is a remarkably interesting time. I wanna remind this very smart room that the number one advertiser on Google during the five to seven golden years of it being massively underpriced attention was a company called Amazon. When you strike, when you have the best hand, you win. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Take care. I think that for the biggest advertisers, I have empathy for many other behaviors, but it is the analogy and needs the context so it's not hyperbolized that when something is grossly underpriced, if, if every English, I'll give you the analogy, if every English Premier League team reached out to RBS Bank right now and said, you know what? Even though we've been getting $15 million a year sponsorships for our stadiums, we like you. And we all wanna offer you eight year deals at one million a year. I think it's probably a good idea for RBS to buy them all. That's where my mind goes with Facebook. I don't think people understand the arbitrage. It's not that television and outdoor and direct mail is zero or dead. Not at all. It's that most of those things are overpriced. This other thing is underpriced. That means it needs its proper allocation. In today's world, if you are a massive company in the UK market, between Instagram and Facebook, you are getting to a shocking amount of people at a very low cost. But meanwhile, they want to deck out a double-decker bus for awareness, you know? So I would say this, nobody is allocating the appropriate amount of money to Facebook and Instagram given how underpriced it is. Do I believe that Pepsi and Puma in the UK should, or in Europe should spend 50, 60% of their money just on Facebook and Instagram? The answer is yes. Should they do a lot of the other things they do? Yep, but they should cut the budgets on all those things so that they can afford the 50 to 60% on Facebook and Instagram. I believe that.